Fundamentals of Mixing, lesson number 15, Levels and Panning. Um, let's just go right over to um, uh, working with uh, uh, the sketchbook here, and then we'll get right into some audio. Um, in a previous uh, posting here on the YouTube channel of one of these classes, I had um, gone through some processes and someone, I think it was gain staging, and then someone was saying, oh, but you've messed up all your levels and panning, or, or all of your gain, your levels. Um, assuming that I had already kind of quickly put together my levels and, and actually I had only very roughly put some things together. And, um, so what's interesting about that is that, and sometimes the difficulty in teaching about levels and panning and the importance of it is that in the overall scheme of things, the, uh, the level and panning process is enormously important to setting up the groove and the structure and the flow of the mix, okay? So there are a lot of considerations that, you know, if you just sort of arbitrarily throw things into particular locations, those particular locations that you place things in the pan field and those particular levels that you set are also going to affect the way that you apply equalization, the way that you apply compression, because you may be compensating for things that are actually better corrected just by pulling down a fader or pulling it up. So rather than adding, you know, a, a whole bunch of two to six K on a, on a vocal, maybe you just need to make it louder, you know? And, and if, if the low end is a little bit uh, too thick, then maybe you just do a little shelving EQ or you kind of, you know, put a little soft, you know, high pass filter on there and kind of take away a little bit of the boominess out of the vocal. And maybe that serves you better. Um, and so uh, there's a fundamental difference there because it's a different sound between adding a frequency area and taking other things away. And uh, so we'll get into that, you know, a bit more with the equalization process. But one of the things that uh, I wanted to focus on in particular with this is this concept or this idea is that when you have a sound and you're changing the levels of it. So let me just uh, kind of take this and move it around, what we're doing is when we're changing the level, we're moving a relative front back positioning. So what do I mean by relative? Relative because certain frequencies like high mid frequencies will naturally pull things forward um, in the speakers. Things that have a full frequency response, a well-represented frequency response low to high. Like if you record a vocal and quite often, one of the reasons why people record vocals with a vocalist very close to the microphone is that one, you get this warm proximity effect. You get this crazy focus detail on, and is assuming that the microphone can handle the SPL level of the person singing, and it actually sounds really good. What happens is you get this full frequency spectrum, very close up focused sound, and that brings it forward in the mix. Um, when you start to pull the microphone away, then that starts to filter off frequencies. So the gain, uh, the amount of SPL changes, but also the frequency response in that exchange changes as well. Now, what happens is that, so if you have something, for example, that's like a guitar part, that's a very warm guitar part, it's naturally going to sound back in the speaker. So remember that high mid frequencies pull things forward toward you. And uh, low mid frequencies will have a tendency to set things farther back. So if you have a warm guitar that doesn't have a lot of top end, not a lot of brightness to it, uh, maybe it's, you know, it's played with fingers instead of a pick or whatever it is, or the pickup selection, the amp, um, it will naturally sit back here. So if you raise the level up, it'll only move it relative to the existing position it is based on the frequency rep response pattern um, and the sonics of the original instrument. Okay. There are also some interference patterns that come into play, and that is going to where that's where we're going to get into the subtractive EQ, which is going to be part of the next lesson. So, in other words, um, when you're working with sounds, like if you have a drum kit and you lay a bass in that drum kit, if you actually start to work and carve away some of the low mid frequencies out of that drum kit, the bass is naturally going to sit more clearly in the position that you want it to. But otherwise, relatively, the bass is only gonna move so far forward. Like you really have to crank the level up way too loud where it's obviously too loud, um, you know, in the context of the mix for it to pull forward. So some instruments will pull naturally more forward easier. Things like acoustic guitars or brighter instruments will have a tendency to pull forward more readily. 
uh, things that have sharp transients, claves, cowbells, um, tambourines, things like that will nor more naturally pull forward, more sharply forward. A thing like a snare drum will pull more forward naturally than a kick drum will. So when you adjust the relative bounces, there are things here in the positioning where you're trying to position instruments so that they occupy the space that you need them to occupy. Okay. Now we're not working with acoustic drums and on this particular song. So when, um, so when I work with this, um, you know, some of the subtractive EQ things when working with uh, purely sampled instrument things are less aggressive and that'll make the process a little bit faster. When you start to work with instruments like, um, you know, acoustically recorded instruments, uh, the subtractive EQ processes end up being a bit more aggressive. So, you know, maybe here and there, I'll throw in some examples of that um, as we go along. And there are some naturally recorded things like guitars and, and such in, in this particular song, but we're going to kind of focus on, on some of that. So one of the things that we have here in the pan, in the scheme is we have this two dimensional space that we're working with, with levels and panning. We're working with a forward, a relative forward back movement, and then also a left to right movement. Now the left to right movement is fixed. The only time that it ends up being a little bit fuzzy is when you have something that is stereo. So for example, if I, uh, let me just see where, where am I? I'm right there. Okay, so uh, let me just select. So let's just say that I have something here that is a stereo instrument. And so let me just kind of, you know, give it a little bit of a shape here, you know, kind of scribble something together. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll take this. When I actually do it, it, it may have a density characteristic that's more centered towards the middle. So in other words, uh, quite often um, a mix is more, you know, mono. Right. In other words, it's actually, let me just see, I think I actually have a way of, yeah, there we go. Um, in other words, most of the density may appear in the middle and you only, only may get little straggling things that are left to right and, and they may be ambient energy. So it's what I would call kind of big mono. And sometimes you end up with things that are very wide where the middle or, or what's in the center is sort of scooped out and you kind of see more image uh, stuff kind of going to the sides. So when you're dealing with stereo material, there's a lots of ways that you can kind of work with it. One way is to set a, a width. The other is you can actually mono it up and kind of focus it and put it in a particular location. And depending upon the density of the production, you may want to end up doing some of that. Um, where it may make sense where it sounds cooler soloed up in stereo, you may want to mono it up for it to have like a more precise, uh, specific location. Um, this gets to be sort of the sardine in the can type of thing, um, where you can only fit so much stuff in the given space. Or maybe a better analogy is like you got a room, the room space that you have to work with, if you're really working with the 3D sound field, is a space that's uh, slightly in front of the speakers um, and then behind the speakers. You have nothing that goes behind you in, in this realm. Um, and, and you can work within that space and you can also work up down. So you have the sort of cube cubicle space that you can work with where you can move stuff kind of below the speakers above the speakers front back and the more that you can kind of do that in the mix process the more room that you're going to create and the bigger you're going to be able to make those individual instruments the more you're going to be able to spread them out and kind of do things but the more per more elements in the production the more that you're going to have to kind of economize things and kind of break things down. So let's go right over to to um, to the mix process here. And let's just do a quick listen of everything here, just as we have it. It's enlightening who we are. Don't have a manual. Together we can use star. We are standing just feet apart, not recognizing the reflection of a superstar. When your legs start to give up, on you still run the race? Yeah, it's just what we have to do to just. Just 
Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I want to focus on some particular aspects of this. I'm going to start by kind of muting everything down, okay? And the way that I'm going to do this is I'm actually just going to start uh, with a quick mute down. Um, and I'm going to try to do this a little bit by little bit. Now, we had talked about prioritizing, like certain tracks that are priorities. Uh, some of the tracks, and maybe I'll go to the edit window here so we can just kind of see. What I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight some of these tracks in uh, in red, or I'll just pick a color just so we can we can kind of um, see them and focus on them. So some of the main tracks here are uh, the the kick, uh, the kick snare claps, this loop, the bass. Uh, the kick is a is a major priority. So uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to make these guys red just so we can kind of highlight the importance of that. Tambourines and some of this other stuff, reverse snares, less important, sticks, um, the hi-hats, that is not a significant part of the production, although it's, I would put an orange on that, like not a, not a major, um, a red character on that. Well, maybe I'll just put it, I'll just put it in red, just kind of, you know, it's, it's like a standard kind of groove thing. So we'll put it in there. Um, uh, so all the effects, um, this guitar, right, this main guitar, uh, and in particular, uh, and this guitar here, those are major players and what's going on here. Uh, let's see. The pad is also big because that plays pretty much throughout the whole song. The strings are also very important, their, their placement and all this. Um, as we get to some of the other things like the roads, the, the synth lead, the horns, um, these are kind of energy building things. They will have a place, but we'll kind of get back to those. And then the lead vocal, right? So that's going to be obviously a major priority and the backgrounds so those are going to be the main elements so if we focus on those basically red uh focused or red featured items then we can start to create the foundation of something from which we build everything up now what ends up happening in all of this is that um once we build this sort of structural foundation of the tracks that really play through the song, most importantly throughout the track, then we'll be able to fill in other elements along the way and and find out. So there are there are foundational instruments that run beginning to end, and then there are elements that are um, are not that way. So you may have something like toms, uh, rack toms, or whatever on a drum kit. If they play just occasionally as transitional fills then it's not an important element of the track. However, if you have like some kind of surfer beat type of thing going on where the whole groove is basically some kind of pattern of, of toms going back and forth, then that becomes like a major element in the mix. And therefore, it's a, it's a featured focus. So where we're going to start is with the kick drum. Uh, so if I start with the kick drum, one of the reasons I'm going to start with the kick drum is that's going to be really the foundation of everything, right? Everything is going to build off of this off of this kick drum, right? And then that is gonna work along with the bass. So now the relative front back position is in, in this particular thing, the kick drum obviously pulls forward a bit more naturally than the bass, although the bass does have like an edginess in the in the upper mids, that, or in the mids, that uh, kind of helps it to pull forward a little bit. Now this, This actually may have two separate levels, this snare, because it actually fills out something with the claps and then it also plays on its own, so it may be, need to be brought up in a particular section. The tambourine also plays along with that backbeat, but it doesn't do so all the time, okay? There's also, um, there's also a drum loop here. That is a bigger part of the groove than the hi-hat, and that's why I'm kind of pushing on, on, on this side of things. Now, what I want to do is I want to focus on one particular thing, which is the kick drum energy here, because this also has some sub-frequency built into it. 
And that's going to be a, a major component of getting these two guys to work together, whether they whether you know that balance between the low end is here and if there are interference patterns, which it sounds like a little bit. Let's see what happens with the hi-hats. All right, so when I'm working with the hi-hats here, and uh, what I'm gonna do is, I think I have, uh, my groups are suspended here. For, so let's see if I have, um, uh, okay, so I do have a, a hat loop um, here, and let's just see if I, okay, so I did tie them together, perfect. Okay, so what I wanna do here is I wanna make these guys the same, so I, because they're basically playing off. One is an open hi-hat, one's a closed hi-hat, so they're kind of working together. And I think this works. So I have to figure out now, where does this play off? So, all right, so what we have here, there are some sort of sweeping sort of uh, type of hi-hat type elements, which are left and right and they kind of go back and forth. So let's see if there's some interplay here. All right, so let's go back. So I can put it in the middle. Those elements are not that prominent though, so. But it doesn't seem to, when I go left or right, it doesn't seem to have like the same kind of flow or vibes. So I really want to notice the way that that plays off of that loop. And then uh, let's just start to bring in some of the other. Now I could also move it off to one side a little bit. So let's just see if that helps. So I'll move it just a touch over to the right, and let's just kind of see how that kind of plays in. Now listen, nothing is fixed. So as I'm working here, I'm trying to think of like, okay, as these percussion elements start, you know, getting placed in, I want to pay very careful attention to the interplay of things. These are small decisions that may think it's like, okay, does that really make a difference? Is that important? It's like, yeah, it's hugely important. So we have two guitars here. I'm just gonna start with them hard left and right. Oh, I have their chorus guitars. All right, so here in the in the chorus section, there are two sets of guitars, right? So there's a set here. I'm actually gonna do, um, uh, let me just see. Um, I'm gonna create a group there. I'm just gonna call these the main guitars. And um, let's just see, so I can. Now I wanna figure out where these guys are gonna fit into the overall production. So it may not be like, like that hard left and right may not be the best placement for them. Oh, looks like I have some pan stuff going on there. Hold on one second here. Let me uh, create some modification for that. Oh, wow. Oh my goodness. Are my globals all set up for all those controls? That's, that's not good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't need that. Um, let's just see here. Yeah, okay. All right. So I hope that's not like a global thing. I'm going to have to check some of these other groups here for a second and just see because that, that ends up creating all kinds of uh, 
issues. Yeah, it looked like that was some kind of thing that was set up there. And that's one of those things. Um, in Pro Tools HD, you can decide exactly what elements um, are linked together. Um, and then they have a globals thing, which is sort of like, this is sort of your standard operating procedure for, you know, for working. And then you can set, if you don't follow globals, you can set attributes that are very specific just to that uh, track, you know. Uh, and so, you know, that's uh, hopefully what's still uh, held together here when we move the set. It's obviously not. Okay, so let me just see here. If I go back to the hats and modify this, this was set to follow the globals. All right, so I want to go turn that off. And then I want to clear this because I don't want all those things. But I do want to tie the panning together on those hi-hats and then kind of move them back over. Um, all right, so uh, that's a good find. I'm glad that I found that. I think I had that at 16. So let's just stay with that. So keeping in mind here, when I'm listening to this, there's a definitive interaction between this definitive interaction between this, the drum loop, the bass, and uh, and the hi-hats and the way the hi-hats are kind of laid out. So there will be some automation like that last little thing that was on there probably will come up. The other thing about not pulling because these parts don't double each other throughout. So my tendency there will be not to put um, those two guitars, let's see if I can find them here. So uh, the guitar main uh, plays in different sections of the song without the other part playing at the same time. And I could put this in, it's kind of strange because this part here on guitar one is in the first chorus, but not in the second chorus. Um, that said, there are other elements that come in, you know, these other guitars come in and it starts to spread wider over that point. So let's kind of, um, that would be the next element and thinking forward to that. And, and I know this is kind of skipping a little bit ahead. Let's just, Sorry about that on the level. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to keep my levels here relatively as low as I can, right? So just kind of monitoring here. It's like, you know, my overall levels are, are basically low, but I don't want to keep, I want to keep this kick drum to be the loudest thing in the mix. So when I'm working with these different levels here, I could make the guitars louder, but I don't want to, I'm keeping in mind that that kick drum is going to be the dr main driving element of the whole track. So I want to... Very focused on the groove, right? So remember when we were talking about the relative width of something? There's a couple of ways that 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 this can kind of go. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set this up in uh, just within this uh, its relative panning scheme. So what I'm doing is I'm tying the pan pots together um, and then making them oppose each other. Um, I think this is probably the coolest of the mix engine setups I've seen in any of the DAWs in terms of working with it. It's so simple. You, you just have, you can make two independent pan pots and you can move them wherever you want to. 
uh, you can uh, tie them together, link them together. So if you mono them up, they move together. Uh, you can make them move opposite of each other. Um, and, uh, and then you can link them together and make them move opposite of each other. So there's lots of, there's lots of um, uh, elements here that you can, ways that you can kind of work with them. So in other words, it may make more sense rather than keeping this really wide to kind of narrowing it down a little bit. And when you notice it kind of raises it up a little bit, leaves some space for those guitars. Now, so that's not necessarily uh, everything because that those pads come in before when those guitars aren't playing. So let's just see what that sounds like. When you start to mono it up, it also gets louder because it pushes the same amount of energy into a smaller area, a smaller width. So the approach here, and this is something that um, I have to kind of stop myself as I'm doing this. So I hope it's not too annoying because I I'm, I want to articulate some. There are a lot of things that I just do naturally because if you do something, you know, almost every day of your life for a long, for decades, literally decades, like three decades, and um, you start to do things naturally they become like um it's like a, what's called an unconscious competency in other words you're not even aware of like you're so you've done it so many times you don't even think about it you're so competent or good and this is not about you know whatever blowing my own horn here or whatever but um that when you do something over and over again you start to just do things naturally and you don't even think about the mechanics of it so i sometimes have to stop myself here and i may be pulling some things down and in my brain i'm thinking it's like okay what i really want to do is i want to start with this and see how low i can make it in the mix where it's still felt as opposed to starting in some louder place like this pad needs to be felt more than heard Okay, so you need to feel the presence of it, like, but you can't, like that kick needs to be heard. That needs to be heard and felt. And that's a much more important part. And that bass is a much more important part because it's a bigger part of the groove and the movement of the track. But this keyboard, when it comes in, is basically occupying a particular space in the mix, you know? And then there's strings. So there's a there's a real interaction here between these two, where there's there's more width on the strings than there is naturally on the pad. And I may want to consider something here, and you know, it, this is sort of uh, stepping outside of the, the realm, which is just to, because I, I can't work with width beyond where maybe I push those out to the side more. So I can move those a little bit wider. So now in, in terms of the way that those two parts fit together by moving this in a little bit, spreading that wider, they occupy, um, they, they serve a really cool function in that the, the strings basically pick up from what's going on. Um, so let me just uh, take this out of here for a second. Um, so the, the, the arrangement starts with that pad and that pad serves a function, which is to, you know, 
basically basically a uh, whole note its way through the chord changes. And then the strings occupy more interest because they're more active or even if they're um, running through chords and doing sustained notes, there's more interest in it. You know, in other words, there's more uh, detail in it than what you get in the pad. So if the pad occupies a little bit more of a center thing, now what happens is when the strings come in and they're a little bit wider, the song starts to expand. And then that that helps as like uh, an articulation. And it also finds like a, a counter space where the two of them can kind of work together. The other thing to consider is that there's also a Rhodes part that kind of plays in in the choruses here. So so let's just see what happens if we kind of go out of this. I'm going to back off a little bit on the bass. So once that string part starts starts to go to those things, it's going to need to be automated up. So I'm going to bring that up a little bit more. Bring the pad back a little bit. So part of the reason why I'm also trying to be a little bit minimalistic about where I put it is that, you know, being conscious of the fact there's a lot of other stuff that's still yet to come into the mix. So let's pick up with the vocal here. The reflection of a superstar. When your legs start to give up And all of this is also working race. in conjunction with uh, It's just what we have to do to just claim the fame With the background vocals That's who we are Ain't no stopping, that's just who we are Trust who you are, Trusting ain't, who no you are. That's that's ain't no stopping, who we that's who we are. Ain't no stopping, that's, that's, that's just who we are If you're um, one technique that you can use that that um, uh, it sometimes it's a little more helpful later on in the mix when your sounds are together. If you need to kind of check balances, sometimes what I'll do is I'll turn the speakers down to really, really, really low volume, like just above the noise floor of the space that you're working in. Really important because what will happen is if you bring the level down, you'll you'll lose, you know, with Fletcher Munson, the lower levels, you lose some top end and some low end, um, a significant amount of low end. And you'll be able to notice right away whether instruments start to disappear and also if instruments are too loud. It's a really good measure for what will happen when you put it on smaller speaker systems, like a quick way of doing it. Sometimes a way of setting a level on something is to do that, is to bring the gain really down and then bring the level down to nothing and then slowly bring it in and notice almost what you're doing is you're listening to everything else except for what you're bringing in and notice when it starts to overtake other things in the mix. And when it starts to overtake other things in the mix, then start to pull it pull it back from that point. Um, and it's an interesting way of uh, just like one kind of quick guide if you're having trouble, because sometimes it's easy like, oh, I want that, that like that hook is really important and I want it to be loud and prominent, but um, it can't overtake the mix either, right?
You can really hear the proximity of how like close the vocal mic is. Now, the one thing, the other thing that that's important with all of this is that these levels are not permanent because like one of the things that I hear right away is that the vocal needs to be thinned out in the low end. Like it's a, there's too much proximity effect on the vocal and that's fine. Okay. Cause that warmth and, and richness is really cool. But what happens is that when I listen to it, it doesn't seem to have like a good place in the mix because that, that low frequency energy, that, that kind of build up creates a little bit of a muffled sound with the vocal that doesn't quite sit right. And of course there's, there aren't effects here. So what happens is, as we start to put on other levels of processing, now what's going to happen is that these elements are going to find their place in the mix uh, a little bit better, and we'll have to make some adjustments. But I do want to get this to kind of piece together really well. When your legs start to give up on you, still run the race. Yeah. So some sibilance there. It's just what we have to do to just claim the fame. All right, so let's let's start with this is a basic thing. Now, again, um, I'm being more meticulous about this rather than just rushing through it because I want you to really focus on how things interact with each other. So sometimes you see me solo something like I solo the bass and I'm already mapping out things that I'm going to need to do to the bass to get this to sit in the track. Like you hear interference patterns, like the the um, the rhythm section loop. Uh, that's right next to the bass um, right here, this drum loop that's right here, that actually has, there are some interference patterns between that, the bass, and the kick drum, and we're going to need to sort those out. So it's going to be part of the subtractive EQ thing, but I can start to map out what those things are in when my head. And we could start to also bring in some of the other elements here. Okay, this is the uh, end or a little break here on lesson number 15, Levels and Panning. So this is part one going over the fundamental tracks, and uh, then we're going to go to part two, uh, which will be the next video where we'll go to all of the secondary tracks.